<clears throat> well, we're looking at uh, part 61 in our Wild Harvest Edibles uh, series. Uh, thou preparest a table before me. <clears throat> and just as we begin, just an important note, I'd like to remind folks about that as you navigate any health challenge, uh, it's always recommended that you partner with a medical practitioner that shares your philosophy of the care of the human body in disease and in health. The information shared here is meant to be educational in nature and to uh, be another tool in your wellness toolbox and aid in returning it to health of sick and maintaining good health when well. It shouldn't be construed as medical advice, uh, just as a tool um, or as tools that have been used successfully by others in similar situations. <clears throat> as always, investigate and verify any treatment protocol or procedure for yourself and not blindly accept anything without due diligence. <clears throat> Thomas Edison said that the doctor of the future will give no medicine but will instruct his patient in the care of the human frame, in diet, and in the cause and prevention of disease. <clears throat> a forward-thinking thought um, that was stated in, in another way uh, in 1885. Ellen White stated that there are many ways of practicing the healing art, but there's only one way that heaven approves. God's remedies are the simple agencies of nature that will not tax or debilitate the system through their powerful properties, <clears throat> pure air and water, cleanliness and the proper diet, Purity of life and a firm trust in God are remedies for the want of which thousands are dying. Yet these remedies are going out of date because their skillful use requires work that the people do not appreciate. Fresh air, exercise, pure water, and clean, sweet premises are within the reach of all, with but little expense. But drugs are expensive, both in the outlay of means and the effect produced upon the system. And of course, way back when John wrote 3 John 1 and 2, he stated that uh, he prayed that we would all prosper and be in health just as your soul prospers. We, we need to take care of our, our souls as well to make sure that it's healthy and can support our healthy physiology. <clears throat> in Romans 12, 1 and 2, uh, Paul stated that I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So today uh, we're going to look at uh, a couple different uh, species of seaweed. A little out of the ordinary, but uh, being on the coast here, it's good to have some ideas of, of things that one could um, utilize even in a coastal situation. So the first one we're gonna look at is uh, hijiki. Uh, that's actually a common name for it. It's scientific, scientific name is how I know it, <clears throat> having taken a, a seaweeds class in college called phycology. I knew it by its uh, genus name as sargassum. There are several different species of sargassum, but they're all, um, all edible. It's, uh, it's also known as gulf weed, common gulf weed, broad tooth gulf weed. Uh, it's often in kind of coastal or, or big bodies of water. <clears throat> There's actually a place called the Sargasso Sea, which is kind of named actually after, after Sargassum. <laughs> and it's an interesting seaweed in that it is very prolific. And it's a, it's a rafting <laughs> mat type of, of seaweed in the sense that it doesn't have a holdfast that anchors it to the bottom in the same way that most algaes do or seaweeds. And in that, in that way, it actually has a tendency to warm up the water around it because it's dark in color and the sun's rays are absorbed into the, the floating mats of this algae and it can actually increase the water temperature. <clears throat> So there's two different, actually three different species, um, but there, there's one here, the Fulatans is native to the Americas and Fusiform is native to Asia, but they're both uh, considered um, usable and edible. <clears throat> its preferred tidal zone is floating. Uh, so it's gonna be uh, as floatsome <clears throat> on the shore, often as a, after a storm or a high tide, but it's gonna be out in the water, just floating mostly freely. Uh, <clears throat> The frond or the blade, you can see a, an up close picture here that have little air bladders associated with it. So that's what helps keep it afloat. Uh, very heavily branched. Uh, it's golden yellow to light brown. It's actually in the brown seaweed category <clears throat> called Phaophyta. Uh, so the one that's more spindly is the Sargassum natans. The more dense fronds are the Fluitans. And then the Fusiform is, uh, <clears throat> is yellowish green to brown, so a darker brown. It has a smooth 
uh, from a smooth thick stipe. <clears throat> so the stipe is the part that goes down the middle and that's uh, what uh, holds it uh, together, the various fronds. So in some countries, it can be so prolific that it can affect tourism. You can imagine, I mean, this looks like almost a foot thick, this uh, sargassum that has come up on this palm blessed beach. Um, there's another beach down below that looks like it's more in a, maybe a temperate climate. Uh, this will grow all the way up to Alaska uh, and then all in the tropics. Uh, the excessive growth on the beaches can rot and just cause a stench like most rotting things do. Uh, looks like these fellows here are trying to make the beach a more pleasant place for their for their uh, patrons. <clears throat> um, and then again, it can warm the water through the sun absorption, but that's a lot of seaweed. Uh, but it rafts around out in the open water uh, as a rafting mat. <clears throat> so it has no hold fast on the stipe. The stipe is, is the dark center portion there in the, in the piece you see there, it's floating. Uh, but it's not uh, not anchored to the ground or to rocks or anything like that. Uh, the stipe runs the entire length and it is often sharply bent at each frond or attachment point. And again, you saw those, those rafting mats that it can make. The fronds and the air sacs are the edible, edible portion, which is basically the seaweed that you see. <coughs> um, <clears throat> you can use it in a number of different ways. This is hijiki canapes with avocado. Uh, so you can use one bowl of fresh hijiki, which is sargassum, an avocado, some fresh tomato, and fresh sprouts of your choice. Uh, you can boil the hijiki for one hour and then dehydrate it. And when you dehydrate it, you can actually just kind of, once it's been boiled, you can roll it out on a, on a, on a mat um, that you would put in your dehydrator or in the oven and uh, flatten it out. And then that will kind of dry together and can be eaten like a cracker. So you can place assorted veggies on top, um, like are illustrated in this this uh, this picture here. Uh, <clears throat> so small cracker-like bites of whatever it is that you are are eating here. So fresh veggies are are the best way to go. Mm. So some medicinal uses for sargassum: uh, it's anti-inflammatory, it's antioxidant in nature, antiviral. Uh, it also actually has indications for anti-tumor treatments. An article from the Nutrition and Cancer in 2021 by Abu Qadir et al. So states uh, uh, an example, the title of is Antimicrobial, Antioxidant, and Anti-Tumor Activities of Sargassum, Linear Folium, and Cystoceria crinida from the Egyptian Mediterranean coast. So that is not a species that we would encounter, but uh, they probably are similar uh, species. They were just studying something that was closer to them. Abu Qadir sounds uh, like a Middle Eastern style of name. So they're using something that's regionally available for them. <clears throat> so boil it and drink it as a tea. Um, it helps to break up phlegm and helps to ease sore throats. Um, all species of sargassum contain low levels of arsenic. So you wanna just make sure that you're not using it as a staple um, for your diet. Some of it is gonna be removed with the rinse, um, but just only eat it in, in small quantities. Don't, uh, don't load up on it. Um, so it's, uh, it's uh, a good seaweed to have around from an edible standpoint, as well as from a medicinal uh, standpoint in that regard. <clears throat> Just thinking about something else around sargassum that I uh, remember from my class. I remember one of my teachers had taken a t-shirt and uh, put the sargassum in some paint um, and actually painted it on that and then put the t-shirt on to kind of do the screen print essentially, except it wasn't a screen, just kind of an impression of the, of the algae. And it was uh, really pretty. Um, so a lot of different things you can do with various types of seaweed. So harvest tips, you wanna do it spring low tides and that's the best time to get it. Uh, it can be collected year round, however, wherever it's growing. Uh, you just wanna be sure you rinse it once and boil it for an hour or more. The middle picture is some dried, uh, boiled uh, sargassum and uh, that's a, kind of the form that you could eat it ready to go. You know, dehydrate it and you can break it into flakes or you can grind it, in, grind it into a powder and that way you can use it as a seasoning or in various other ways. So when you boil it and it's subjected to heat, it goes from the golden brown uh, to the black coloration. Most seaweed does go black after it's been dried or processed. So when you purchase seaweed, if you hold it up to the light, it's got some green to it often. 
but it's going to look very, very dark, uh, almost to black. The next one that we'll look at is wakami. It's also known as Unadiria uh, panathidia and Alaria marginata. So the Alaria marginata is how I learned it. It's a North, the North American uh, variant. It's also known as sea mustard or winged kelp. It has a central midrib, which is the dark linear portion. Uh, and that's the key way of identifying it. It prefers areas that are down to 23 feet deep. So from the surface to 23 feet. Uh, and actually, depending on the tidal zone, it likes mid to low tide zone. It's not going to be growing in the upper inner tidal uh, just because it's out of water much too frequently for the algae to survive. Um, occasionally, it'll be even further subtidal uh, and uh, residing below the tide. One thing to keep in mind is when you're doing harvest of seaweed, in, at least in, in Washington state, uh, it requires a permit, a shellfish permit. Uh, with a seaweed addendum, and uh, I think they, uh, my recollection is that 10 pounds per fresh seaweed per person per day, and that's uh, the maximum amount that you can gather, basically to help prevent over harvest. Um, if you're just walking along the beach and you're just sampling it along the way, that's that's no problem. But if you're collecting it in quantity, then there there may be someone who would uh, ask you for your your permit potentially. The frond or the blade, uh, so in ferns, we usually think of frond, depending on the way it's presented. A blade is usually a sheet of, of, of seaweed, as opposed to a frond um, it is more leafy in nature, but it has a long, wide, um, uh, belted frond and a thick, flattened central midrib and wavy or lobed edges that we saw in the previous pictures. It can be up to six feet long uh, and uh, even up to 13 feet long. It's olive green to dark brown. Uh, the hold fast you can see in the upper picture here is that uh, portion on the right. That's what anchors it to the rock or the other hard surfaces upon which it is, is has attached itself. And uh, it can often look very, very twisted, like just a knotty mass. Uh, and then the stipe is uh, can be thick and uh, stout as it reaches up to where the blades attach. Uh, typically, it's one fifth the length of the blade from a, a ratio standpoint. It's just one way to identify it from other types of, of seaweeds. The blade or the frond is the edible part, and it's actually one of the high fiber seaweeds. So not all seaweeds are 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 high in fiber, but this one is is high in fiber, and it's important. To have fiber in the diet, and that's a good place to, to get fiber from a, a sea source. Uh, it helps to maintain just intestinal motility, uh, moisture retention, um, carrying uh, toxins from the body, um, allowing the stool to have uh, bulk so that it moves uh, smoothly through the system, um, and a host of other factors. Uh, so it's, uh, it's good for the fiber source from a seaweed standpoint. From a harvest standpoint, uh, the upper end, the upper tips, the blades, you want to avoid the, the base fronds. So we saw talked about it as being winged kelp. So there's some small fronds down at the base of the stipe where the blades begin. Those are the reproductive uh, fronds. You just want the, the larger uh, portion of it that sticks up beyond that. Compost, the midrib. So you're going to be using the, the non-midrib. That's a thick, tough part of it. Uh, just use the wavy, thin outer uh, margins. Uh, seaweed makes a good compost. Uh, it uh, decomposes well and adds minerals to whatever compost you're using. Uh, so that's uh, a good asset for it. So you can use it fresh in salads or as you would any other leafy green. You can dry it, you can cook it, you can pickle it, you can smoke it or blanch it. Uh, essentially, it's a good seaweed to just try things with and experiment. So you can see that there's a variety of different ways, a couple different ways that are shown here that um, it can be used effectively. You can make yourself some wakami tortillas. So one bowl of rinsed wakami frond, and then remove the midrib and uh, air dry it in the sun until it's nearly dry. You can see how long it is here in this gentleman's uh, hands. Uh, down by his left hand there, you can see the smaller ones, which are the wings, where it gets its name, the winged kelp. You can see the very distinct midrib there and the wavy margins. 
Then you would cut the fronds into tortilla-sized pieces. You can warm them in a skillet for two to three uh, minutes or just, you know, just play with the heat and see what works best. And then use it like you would any other kind of tortilla or tortilla chip. You can use it with salsa maybe, or just use it as a chip or even uh, wrap, wrap things in it, depending on how, how stiff it gets when you expose it to heat. The beautiful thing about seaweed is that it can be dried out almost completely by the sunshine. And once it uh, comes back in contact with the seawater, then it just rehydrates and the metabolism of it kicks right back up. It's activated and it just goes on uh, living and producing as if it had never been dried out. Uh, so that's only within a, you know, a certain amount of, of time or else it would grow higher in the intertidal zone. Uh, <clears throat> so growing down where it does, it does require more time to be in the water and saturated with the, with the, the seawater than those that are tolerant for longer times of period without any kind of moisture. So that's looking at two different seaweeds on the Pacific coast uh, that uh, are actually also uh, common uh, in the Western Pacific. The Western Pacific is uh, Asia. We're in the Eastern Pacific. Uh, which is kind of a different way of looking at where we are geographically. We always think of ourselves as being on the West Coast, but that's the West Coast of North America. We're on the Eastern Pacific. <clears throat> so just uh, a fun way to have thought about that. So you can review this again and look at uh, other seaweed that we've talked about at uh, preparingforthetimeoftrouble.com. <laughs>